Hello, I'm Dr. Arthur Brodsky, Associate Director of Scientific Content at the Cancer Research Institute. And I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. Yvonne Chen of the University of California, Los Angeles and the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. Welcome, Dr. Chen. Thank you for having me. So last time we spoke uh, was right after you were selected as a CRI star, and you laid out your vision for how you want to design better CAR T cells. Uh, and before we get into the discoveries that you've made, I thought it would be good to just start with a brief overview of CAR T cells. Sure. Um, we work on CAR T cells. CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor, which are essentially synthetic proteins that we engineer to help redirect T cells, which are white blood cells, to recognize disease cells that we want to get rid of. And we focus primarily on cancer cells. And um, there are a number of CAR T cell therapies now approved by the FDA, uh, mostly to treat hematological malignancies, leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. And uh, we, as researchers, are primarily interested in understanding what currently limits the safety or efficacy of CAR T cell therapy and finding ways to engineer better ones um, that can provide greater benefits to our patients. And so uh, the, the most common form of CAR T cell therapy is what we would call autologous T cell therapy. That means we take T cells out of the cancer patient we genetically modify them to express tumor targeting CARs. We expand or grow these T cells in the laboratory, and then we give the T cells back to the same cancer patient where these T cells can now recognize tumor cells and hopefully kill them. Um, we're developing newer kinds of CARs, for example, CARs that can target more than just one uh, antigen, which is would be a protein associated with the tumor. And that makes it more difficult for the tumors to escape by losing the target antigen. And so you alluded to the new strategies that you're using to try to improve CAR T cell therapy for patients. Um, and I know that one of the challenges we discussed last time was antigen escape, whereby you can design CAR T cells to target one molecule and then the, the cancer cells can lose that molecule and essentially become invisible. Um, but I understand that you've developed the new CAR T cell uh, that's called a bispecific CAR T cell that targets two different cancer markers. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how that trial has been going? Yeah, definitely. So the bispecific CAR T cell therapy we developed is uh, for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it targets two different antigens uh, called CD19 and CD20. These are both proteins on the surface of B cells, including the vast majority of cancers or lymphoma B cells. And the, the, the rationale for having a bispecific CAR is it makes it a lot more difficult for the tumors to escape from therapy. So they sometimes can do that by losing the antigen that is targeted by the T cell. So if the T cell can target two different antigens, the tumor would have to lose both of them um, in order to successfully escape. And the probability of that happening is much lower than if they only needed to lose one. So the two targets that we have uh, aimed our T cells at, CD19 and CD20, are both very highly expressed on lymphoma cells. We started a phase one dose escalation trial here at UCLA at the end of 2019. Uh, we have been able to treat 11 patients to date. Um, the most recent patient was dosed about a month ago, so it's too early to assess for response. Uh, but among the first 10 patients who have reached response assessment, um, nine of them responded to therapy and seven of them reach a complete response. And so that's a very high response rate for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And very importantly, uh, we have seen very little toxicity that's uh, directly associated with CAR T cells. We have uh, to date not seen any neural toxicity in any of our patients. And the only cytokine release syndrome, which is another commonly seen side effect associated with CAR T cell therapy, that we have seen so far is grade one, which is the mildest grade. And so we're particularly excited about this because I think the field over the past uh, decade or so had come to expect that for T cell therapy to be very efficacious, we also need to accept a fairly high level of toxicity. And here we have an example that, that would suggest that if we engineer the therapy correctly, we may not need to accept that kind of a trade-off, um, at least not in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's incredible to learn how, how potentially safe and effective they are. So in addition to the cancer being able to escape the immune system through the antigen escape that you just discussed, 
Um, the T cell, the CAR T cells can also become exhausted, uh, which can kind of be an issue for their persistence over time and cause them to become dysfunctional. And then when they become dysfunctional, the cancer can come back. So are you looking at any strategies to hopefully address this? Yeah, so I think um, you pointed out a very important problem in the CAR T cell engineering field, which is sometimes we get cars that work beautifully, such as the CD19 car and the bispecific car we're testing in the clinic. Um, and sometimes they don't. And it's not always obvious why um, some cars don't work uh, very well. Uh, what we can observe is that some of these T cells get exhausted, as you say, and that's actually a scientific term in T cell biology, where T cells basically become dysfunctional over time as if they have run out of steam. And it's not always obvious, again, why the T cells become exhausted. Exhausted. One proposed mechanism is what you mentioned earlier, tonic signaling. That refers to when these cars, which are receptors, uh, will signal even when they're not supposed to be signaling. Okay, so even when there is no antigen that's triggering the car, some of these cars would just signal at baseline. And it is believed that excessive amounts of signaling eventually drives the T cells to exhaustion. And so, as I mentioned earlier, our, our bispecific car targets CD19 and CD20. And so one of the natural question is, why do you need both? You know, why not, for example, just target CD20, um, which is actually a, you know, a, an antigen that has a long history of being uh, treated in the clinic for lymphoma. And in fact, patients often uh, retain CD20 expression even after repeated rounds of anti-CD20 antibody therapies, such as rituximab. And so that would suggest to us that CD20 isn't very vulnerable to antigen escape. And yet CD20 targeted CAR T cell therapy has not done um, as well as CD19, um, at least not in the early years of development. And so our lab became interested in trying to understand what's the difference between CD19 and CD20 CARs. And through that comparison, can we uh, identify design principles that will allow us to rationally design cars that are reliably efficacious, right? And so with CRI support, uh, we did extensive, uh, quite systematic analysis of um, the car protein itself, trying to modify different portions of it in order to understand which part of the car uh, affects the way the car signal and affects the car T cells efficacy. And you know, we're certainly not the only people who's ever asked this question, right? And, and many, many years of uh, work by multiple groups have, have already elucidated certain parameters that clearly are important, right? For example, the binding affinity of the car, the size, the rigidity of the car protein. Uh, what we found though, uh, was that there are very, very subtle uh, details about the car uh, architecture and the car sequence that can profoundly influence the way CAR T cells behave. Uh, and, and, and it's not obvious up front that it, they should. Um, so to give you an example, a CAR protein um, is, I would say about 700 amino acids long, uh, give or take, different CARs have different sizes. We found that simply inserting two amino acids and not just any amino acids, two alanines, which are usually considered as the most benign, the most sort of inactive uh, amino acids in these uh, receptors can drastically change the way uh, they attack tumor cells. And uh, we believe the reason that alanine insertion can change uh, CAR T cell behavior is that it changes the shape or conformation of the CAR protein. Um, we also found that if you change the sequence of the portion of the CAR called the single chain variable fragment or SCFV uh, that actually binds the antigen can also significantly impact the CAR, um, but not for the obvious reason, okay? So it's not changing the CAR by changing the binding affinity. Okay, the affinity is the same. It binds the same antigen at the same spot. And yet changing the sequence can drastically change tonic signaling behavior as well as just the overall functionality of the CAR T cell. And so these are the kinds of investigations we've been able to do with CRI um, support. And the hope is that at the end of the day, we're going to move closer to having CAR T cell engineering be 
engineering, as in we understand how each part contributes to the CAR T cells behavior and can rationally um, change the different components to tune them um, and move farther away from trial and error, where we just have to test a lot of different designs and see which one works. It's great to hear that you're headed in the right direction. And as you said, more rationally design them so we can fine tune them to do exactly what we want them to do and not do any of the things we don't want them to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, these, these issues that we've been discussing so far uh, apply to, I guess, or just focus on the interaction between the cancer cell and the CAR T cell. Um, but obviously there's a lot of other factors at play, um, especially when it comes to solid tumors. You mentioned earlier that CAR T cells have worked pretty well uh, against certain types of blood cancers, uh, but against solid tumors, which make up, which affect all the other organs and make up the majority of tumors, they don't really work well. Um, and a lot of that is because of the tumor microenvironment, which can, which has signals and molecules that can shut down and suppress the immune responses, uh, including with CAR T cells. So where is, where is the field right now, uh, you know, as far as the strategies that we're exploring to uh, tackle this issue? Yeah, that's a great question. Solid tumors account for about 90% of all cancer diagnoses and cancer deaths in the U.S. every year. And so it, it is a primary focus for most CAR T cell um, research laboratories now trying to figure out how to make this more effective against solid tumors. Um, there are many different things that actually contribute to the difficulty um, that CAR T cells have against solid tumors. For example, uh, unlike blood cancers, which happen to be in the same physical space as T cells, um, which is in the bloodstream, um, solid tumors are not where T cells naturally are. And so the first thing is, how do you get the T cells to find the tumor uh, in the first place? That's a trafficking issue. And then once the T cells find the tumor, there's a second layer of trafficking, which is how does the T cell get through to the solid tumor? How does the T cell penetrate or infiltrate into the solid tumor? Um, and then there's a third problem, which is actually related to the second one, and we call that immunosuppression. Okay, so that means the tumor microenvironment, the area surrounding the solid tumor, oftentimes is very hostile. Uh, to immune cells. So, uh, tumor cells have learned to secrete proteins and other soluble factors that can drive T cells to dysfunction. And, and in fact, not just T cells, other kinds of immune cells as well. And so the third challenge is how do we keep our T cells functional when they are in the tumor microenvironment? Um, and so my, my group and many others have been thinking about different strategies to overcome these various challenges, right? Um, for example, one can try to make the tumor more inflamed with oncolytic viruses, et cetera, so that they can attract tumor cells through inflammatory signals. One can engineer the T cells to secrete chemokines and cytokines that will allow them to traffic uh, to tumor sites. Uh, one can also engineer, this is sometimes referred to as armoring T CAR T cells, right? So you have armored CARs uh, that can, um, secrete soluble factors um, to help them along in that environment. Our, our, our own group had developed, for example, a, a new kind of car that can respond to TGF beta, which stands for transforming growth factor beta, um, which is one of the key immunosuppressive cytokines that many different solid tumors produce, right? And in the solid tumor microenvironment, a high level of TGF beta uh, would trigger immune dysfunction, including T cell dysfunction. And what we've been able to do is engineer a car that can not only help the T cells resist the natural signaling behavior of um, TGF beta, but actually turn it on its head, convert TGF beta into an activating signal for our T cells. Um, and in that way, our T cells not only do not become dysfunctional, they actually become more functional when the tumor microenvironment presents a lot of TGF beta. And the hope is this will not only protect our CAR T cells, our engineered CAR T cells, but actually start modifying that tumor microenvironment so that native endogenous immune cells that we have not engineered can also benefit from our design because the environment is now changing uh, 
as a result of our CAR T cell therapy. Now that you're now that you're three years into your STAR funding, um, how has this CRI Lloyd Gerald STAR funding really helped you address some of these complex problems that that are uh, you know at the forefront of the cancer immunotherapy and CAR T cell fields? Yeah, uh, CRI funding has been tremendously helpful in our research. I think a, a key point is our our you know, engineering cell-based immunotherapy is unfortunately very, very expensive. And so you have to sort of decide, you know, what are you going to focus on and what's the most efficient way to answer that question, right? Um, but sometimes science doesn't take a straight path. You know, the first idea you come up with doesn't always work out. And what CRI has enabled us to do is take the risk of trying ideas that we believe are going to be good ideas but also be able to afford the risk of it not working out so that we're not always trying the safest idea, you know, something that, you know, other people have already done and we're just doing minor twists to it, right? We're, we're able to take bigger risks to try newer things, knowing that some of it may fail, um, but because we have the support of the CRI, we feel confident that we will do our best and see if we can develop a truly um, novel therapy that is both safe and efficacious for patients. That's amazing to hear. And really happy to hear, you know, as you mentioned, that the high risk work is the work that will get us to the next level and not just give us incremental improvements, but that will actually lead to revolutionary changes in care for patients and save more lives. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Chen, for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, can't wait to hear more about your exciting work. Thank you. It's great to be with you.